Listen, I'm glad to be in church tonight. How about you? You be careful. I might start thinking you like being at church. Careful, careful. You know, those supposed to be, we're Baptists. We're Baptists, right? We can't show emotion at church. Heaven, heaven forbid we smile. Heaven forbid that, that something that happens we actually agree with. And uh, boy, I'm glad for what God can do and wants to do here at First Baptist Church and around the world. In fact, there's uh, what I'm told, and a little bit of observation that I saw, there's a revival going on at a college, Asbury College. Maybe many of you have seen bits and snippets of this, and uh, it's amazing what God can do. God can do anything, anywhere he wants to. And there's a number of people that are for this, but there's some, there are some Baptists who are against revival if it doesn't start in a Baptist church. And I just have to imagine when we get to heaven that as we're praising God for centuries and forever, that there'll probably be someone besides Baptist up there. <laughs> just saying. I'm just now, now I believe that what we believe is correct for the Word of God. But I tell you what, God can honor Himself. I saw one article, they said, well, there is these people involved, and they have no reason being involved. And I thought that, you know, you know that, that's our problem sometimes. We get so inwardly focused and so prideful that we think God can't work anywhere else. And if God, and this is what's terrible, that if God is working somewhere else, it's obviously because of compromise. Or what we're really saying is that they're having the devil's help in it. Isn't that just so prideful and arrogant? Isn't that terrible? You know, so here, here's the truth. And it leads right into the service tonight. We'll go to Psalm chapter 12. The truth is this. The reason that we have, when we see God's blessing, not only in a, in a church that I believe is founded correctly, like First Baptist Church that has a correct belief, but other places that we'd be maybe slightly different on, is because God blesses his word. God blesses his truth. Remember when, when some were, were testifying and prophesying and, and Jesus, they came to Jesus. Well, what are they doing? Paul was in bondage. They came to Paul. They're preaching Christ just to make sure that your, your prison time is even harder. And to Moses, they came to Moses, said, people, there's, there's prophesying outside the tent. Moses, and you didn't authorize it. In all those circumstances, God honors his word and his truth. If someone, all right, even a donkey, brings the truth, God honors his truth. And sometimes the vessel is not exactly what we would think it ought to be or maybe what it even should be. And we ought to be the best vessel we can be. I think we looked at that this morning to be the right building. We ought to be right before the Lord. I mean, that's, that's the best scenario. But God blesses his truth and his word. And it's a lot bigger than you and me. But tonight we're going to look at the word of God about the word of God. It just I'm excited. Turn it, please, to Psalm number 12. In your Bible, if it has, if it has notes at the top of, of the psalm, which many Bibles do, it'll say to the chief musician upon Shimoneth, the psalm of David. Some controversy or not, not some discussion, not controversy, discussion about what that Shimoneth or what that is, and it is maybe particularly an eight-stringed instrument and probably a lower octave with the concept of bringing some, uh, some emphasis or it would have been a little different than other instruments, a little different than even some of the normal psalms that would have been sung. It would have sounded a little bit different to bring some additional emphasis, some additional focus on the truth that they would have been singing about. And now tonight, the focus, because it's the inspired word of God. We bring some focus on Psalm number 12. We're going to look at what God has for us. Please, in verse number 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Now, most of the psalms we look at come from a place of turbulence and situations that are less than ideal. There are some psalms that will stand apart from that, will come toward the end of the book of psalms in 10 or 12 years. And we'll find out about the praising psalms. I'm just kidding. But many psalms deal with just a position of helplessness, of hurt, where there are things going on that 
that they're, they're troubled with. And it's not lost on me that the longest book in the Bible is filled with song after song after song, seeking God's deliverance. Because in your life and in my life, very often, we are at this place where we need God to help us. Or we need God to bail us out. But I love how the Psalms seem to always, with, with just the power of God, bring a little different nuance to the conversation. In Psalm chapter 12, as we look at it, I think, I think it'll be a help to you. It's the word of God, but just what God has for us. Verse number two, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Remember verse number five. Verse six. The words of the Lord are pure words. A silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Tonight, with the Lord's help, before we pray, I want us to consider the contrast of man's words and God's words. Tonight, to take a moment just to ask ourselves these two questions that I will pose now and at the end of the sermon. The first question, am I listening more to man's words or to God's words? The second question, am I speaking more of man's words? We'll see what that looks like from this passage. Or am I communicating in a fashion that God would communicate in? It's the contrast of man's words and God's words. Let's pray tonight as we begin. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. In our life, there are struggles, trials, burdens. And Lord, in this passage, we see your help. We see your deliverance. And Lord, tonight I pray that you would illuminate this passage to each person in this room. That by the end, we, through the prompting of your Holy Spirit, would really consider those two questions about who we're listening to and how we're communicating. And if there's an area or areas in our mind or our speech that do not please you or that are not in accordance with your word, Lord, I'd ask that tonight that we would have the grace, the willingness, the humility to respond to you. And Lord, that we would cling to, embrace, and hold to, and converse in your words. Lord, bless this time. Love you. Need your help, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In our life, we have grown up with many little adages, many little phrases that can be helpful to us. Phrase like, don't cry over spilled milk. Meaning that there are some things in life that just are, or it is what it, it is. It can be helpful to us. It can help us kind of navigate uh, this particular, uh, navigate this life. And just little, little, little uh, proverbs, perhaps, little thoughts that kind of just gems of, of wisdom, nuggets of understanding that can help someone just kind of make some good choices and navigate fairly well. But there is one adage that, you have heard, no doubt, and heard as a child that is completely and utterly, totally, 100% false. It is a lie. I'm going to tell you what that is tonight. It's a lie, and, and if you're taking notes, you ought to write this down, circle it, never say it, and stop believing it. The adage goes like this, and help me as you remember it, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. What a lie. What a joke. 
What complete and utter fabrication and disconnect to reality. Because reality is that while sticks and stones hurt for a moment, words can hurt for a lifetime. Is that not true? How many remember, now young people close to you, how many remember junior high? Johnny, you remember junior high? Yeah, it was yesterday. It's cool. I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> All right, how many old people in here remember junior high? Is anyone in this room of you, of you older, elderly, senior saints, anybody remember a particularly rude or crude or unkind comment from a classmate 20 or 30 years ago? Anybody? Put them up there if you remember that. Anybody remember 40 years ago? Like, I remember somebody saying this, and I still remember. It's funny what our minds goes back to, is it not? I still, I can still remember some myself. I still remember a, a young student, a classmate of mine. He, I remember his name. His last name was Hopkins, if you remember. I remember what he looks like. He sat right by me. I remember what he said to me. I don't remember what day of the week it was. I remember what, what, how old I was and what year it was. But I remember what he said. I remember how I felt, and how it hurt my heart. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but those things heal relatively quickly. Words will hurt. They do hurt. They have hurt. Have they not? In relationships between a child and a parent, words spoken in anger, frustration, Words that could never be taken back. Words spoken between friends and then you find out that after that particularly tough conversation where harsh words were exchanged, they never spoke to each other again. Words spoken <coughs> between a husband and a wife and ultimately lead to separation. Words. Words are powerful. Proverbs says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words. But tonight, I want us to contrast the words. I'm not here from the book of James, which will challenge us to make sure our tongues are controlled. But from this passage, to point out what David was facing. And what he was facing was an attack from people, and it was attack with their words. In other passages, they're going to attack with their arrows and their spears, all right, and their might. But this psalm points us to attack from their words or man's words. And David feels just as vulnerable. David feels just as overwhelmed if I can, as if they were attacking with chariots and spears and arrows because words are damaging. Words can be deadly. Words do hurt for a long, long, long time. And here we see verse number one. We begin to see the cry from David where he says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. And here's why the reason. Because they speak. It goes on in the next few verses to describe how they speak. And I believe to describe it, to give us a description of what man's words, or if I can tonight, the corruption of man's words. The problem is that sometimes Christians who claim the name of Jesus who know the word of God, can still speak the ways that are described in these verses. That question, am I communicating in a way that mimics or displays man's words? I see in these verses a few different descriptions. In verse number two, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak, or heart in heart. I describe it this way. Man's words are useless and deceptive. Man's words in this passage, in contrast to God's words, all right, man's words are useless and deceptive. They speak vanity. They speak emptiness. They speak worthlessness. Now, this is not the conversation of someone who just won't shut their mouth. We've all been stuck in that before. 
where you ask a simple question and you get an hour-long answer. And you're like, that was empty and that's it. That's man's words. I don't know. This is someone who is not seeking for the eternal, but seeking just to be useless to his neighbor and to be deceptive. You know, we are called throughout the Bible to mimic God, to display God, and God is truth. God is not lie. In fact, he says the father of lies is the devil, and before we're saved, he is our father. Once we're saved, our father is the God of truth. A lady once went to her pastor, apologizing for some untrue, unkind statements she made about him. The story goes he promised to forgive her, but asked as a condition of forgiveness that she take a bag of feathers to the center of town and throw them up in the air, allowing them to be caught in the wind. She thought the request was strange, but wanted her pastor's forgiveness and so complied. When she was done, she came back and he said, there's one more thing I'd like you to do. Go back and get the feathers and put them all back in the bag. Astonished, she said, I can't. The wind has taken them everywhere. He says, yes, and though I've forgiven you, The words you've spoken have traveled far and can never be brought back. You know, sometimes in our relationships, we speak man's words. We don't speak the truth. We speak in a deceptive manner. I I sometimes use this with with couples. And those who are married can maybe identify with this. And those who are not, I think, can still see the the, the, um, truth in in the situation. Let's imagine, men, you're coming home from a long day at work. And this particular day, your wife has been home all day. As you come into the house, you see that she's doing dishes. All right? I'm not commenting on roles. I'm just painting a scenario. As she's doing dishes, she does a dish. You with me so far? Everything's normal? Yes or no? No. So the husband asks, noticing that it seems the dishes are done rather forcefully, honey, what's wrong? And she says, nothing. It's her response, nothing. Man's words or God's words? Man's words. Truthful or deceptive? At this point, this man has quite the conundrum. Quite the conundrum. And this could be man or woman. Just in this illustration, it was man and a woman. It could go the other way around. At this point, the man has a, has a tough decision to make. If he takes his wife for truth. Nothing's wrong. So he goes in the back room and changes and walks outside and begins to do his own thing. Are things going up or going down? Help me here. You know. If he realizes that his spouse has not been completely truthful and says, no, no, something's wrong. Tell me. Something's wrong. Tell me. Something's wrong. Crash. You see... Man's words versus God's words. Man's words are filled with uselessness and vanity and deceit. And every time that we communicate in man's philosophy, we cause bigger problems. Bigger problems. I know some of you kids in this church, some of you kids have chores to do. Brenton, do you have chores? Really? Come on, Bill. What's wrong with you? Just little chores, oh, little chores. Are they, big, are they little or are they big chores? He said they're big chores. No, somebody's not telling me the truth. No, no. <laughs> no, nah, he's a good dad. He gives his son chores, all right? Chores always look bigger from the one doing them and smaller from the one issuing them. Come on. This, this is truth tonight. This, you know. Sometimes you're doing chores, right? You look around and you're like, I'm the only one doing anything. Hits all of us. Old, young, husband, wife, friends are like, I'm the only one in this house who does anything. All right, look at my parents sitting there and relaxing. My goodness, they don't do, my parents don't do anything. Look at my husband, look at, look at my wife. Oh, I'm the one working all day. And those, those thoughts are not right, but there's sometimes a reality in our life. And then we communicate in, in man's words. Deceptive words. Like this. Must be nice. Must be nice to be able to relax right now. Now, do we really mean it must be nice? No, that's deceptive. What we're trying to say is, 
hey, I feel like I'm, doing all, I'm carrying all the load right now. Must be nice to be able to sit there and relax while I still have laundry to fold. Must be nice to be able to relax while I'm cutting the grass still. Must be nice, must be nice. Again, man's words describe useless and deceptive. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, our regard for truth will be broken down and slightly weakened, and then things will remain doubtful. God's words are not useless, they are not deceptive, but man's words are. And we must learn to communicate not in man's words, but in God's words. Not only do I see the description of uselessness and, and deceit, look in verse number three, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Not only are man's words useless and deceptive, they are fleeting and prideful. It's all about me, me first. Or if I can, everything that's done has an angle on it. I know that in your life, those who have been around a little bit, you've met people who instantly you think they've got an angle. They're trying to get something. Sometimes you can't put your finger on it. They're saying the right words, but you, right, Brother Treadwell, you know. You listen to them, you look at them, you're like, they're just working an angle. It starts when kids are young. Remember coming out of my bathroom a while back, a couple years ago, and all my kids sitting there on the bed with their hands folded like this. What's your angle, kids? Because obviously, my kids don't sit still that often. There they are, just smiling. Okay, now I'm really worried. What's your, what's your angle? Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Every kid in here, those who are old, were kids once, you know exactly what I'm saying. Where you're like, hey, Dad, you're the best dad in the world. What do you want? Mom, just love you the most. Okay, okay. An angle. This is man's words, fleeting and prideful, looking for the angle where it's all about me. It's all about positioning myself above in the situation. This would be the classic fisherman story, the one that makes sure that attention is always focused on me and not on anyone else. You find this among Christians, I mean among church, where people talk and before you can finish, they begin their own story. Fleeting and prideful. But then verse number four, it continues where it says, Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? There is a selfishness and a rebellion to man's, to man's words. In essence, David says, they look here and they say, You know what? No one will tell me what to do. No one will dictate to me the way that I will communicate. No one who is Lord over us. Who's the boss? It's selfishness and rebellion. I read a story about a man who won the million-dollar lottery. He flew with his wife to New York City for a weekend getaway, and they had such an argument over how to spend the money that she threatened to divorce him over winning this check of a million dollars. In a fit of anger, he went up to the top of the Empire, to the, to the deck of the Empire State Building. And she ran up after him, thinking he's probably going to do something crazy. Once she got to the top, she said, Honey, I love you. I think we can work it out. But by the time she reached him, he unfortunately had already torn the check into hundreds of small pieces and thrown it to the ground. Apparently, they rushed down the elevator. The Empire State Building got down there, got a number of pieces, but they didn't get enough pieces to be able to put the check back together, no matter how, how hard they tried. That's what happens when we become selfish and rebellious. With our words, we tear up things that are precious, that are beautiful. And unfortunately, with the wrong type of communication, we sometimes can leave such a mess that it's impossible to put it back together again. But I'm glad the psalm doesn't stop there. I'm glad that, that though we have that description, we have these beautiful verses of contrast. Look in verse number six. It says, But the words of the Lord, the words, Lord's, the, the words of the Lord are pure words, 
As silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Let me give you two descriptions of God's words. Number one, they're valuable and they're refined. That's what I mean by refined. The the verse here gives us the analogy, the idea of silver being purified in a furnace. And what they do is they take this silver and they would scrape off the impurities until what was left there in the pot was perfect, complete, genuine, without any impurity, silver. And the Bible says that God's words, his language, his truth is as silver that's been purified not once. Be pretty good silver after one purification. Not twice. It'd be real good. Not three times, not five times, but seven times. And the the psalmist says, the words of the Lord are so refined, they are so without impurity that when you have them, You have something that is so pure and so precious. This silver would be the the finest silver in the world. That what you have is so valuable, is so helpful, and so pure. It is in complete contrast to everything else. You see, I find that God's words are never unsure. You read God's word, it's never unsure. It's never unnecessary. Your life and my life, the word of God is necessary. It's never unimportant. And it's never unusable. If I were tonight, if I were to give you pure, refined gold. If I said everyone here tonight will get as much of this pure, refined gold as you want. Would you come and get me after the service? How much would you take? Oh, pastor, that's all right. Just give me just a little cap. Well, scrape me off a piece off the edge. Uh, I, I don't need any more pure, refined gold in my life. Everything I need, I have it. And so I, I, there's nothing that I would buy with it. There's, can't imagine any vacation I would take and no small private islands that I want to buy. No private jets that I want to keep in every single city in the U.S., No, 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 just scrape me off of the corner. But God's word is more valuable than pure, refined gold. And if I had just piles of gold up here, you would, if you could, come and take it. And if I said, take as much as you want, my goodness, I bet you'd find every way to get it. Can I come back again? I fill up my vehicle tonight. Can I come back tomorrow? Can I come back in five minutes? Can I borrow a truck? Can I borrow a semi-truck? Can I rent a storage facility? You You would spare no expense to get this product. And yet the Bible says that God's words are so valuable. They are so precious. That sometimes we just set them aside. And we spend so much more time over here. We have the word of God. But we don't cling to it like it's precious. We listen to everybody else. We listen to their opinion. Listen to their their take on the situation. We use the old phone a friend method. But now in 2023, we text a friend. We post it to a board. We get all their opinion, but but we set what's valuable aside. And here we have the contrast. There's man's words which are useless and deceptive, which are selfish and rebellious, which are fleeting and prideful. And we have God's words, which are valuable and they're refined. They will be helpful. They will be valuable. They will meet the need that you have. And not only are they valuable and refined, they are secure and eternal. Verse number seven. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. In 1526, William Tyndale, he had produced the first English translation of the Bible. It was printed now, he printed it, the first one to be printed on a printing press. This new version that he had, he had printed was hated by the Roman Catholic Church. And in particular, the Bishop of London sought personally to destroy the Bibles that William Tyndale had printed. God's words. A certain man by the name of John Packington knew the bishop 
and his hatred of the Tyndale translation, but was also secretly a friend of Tyndale. He went to the Bishop of London, and he said, he, he said, I know how to get all of William Tyndale's Bibles. The bishop told him to get them, and that he would gladly pay whatever they cost. So the Bishop of London promised to buy them with the intention of burning them all at Paul's Cross Cathedral in London. Packington, who was Tyndale's friend, went back to Packington, as the story goes. And he told William Tyndale what had taken place. He said that the bishop will buy all the Bibles, and he knows the bishop will burn the Bibles. The problem was that Tyndale had been deeply indebted by the first run of these Bibles. Tyndale decided to sell all of the Bibles to the Bishop of London. Now remember, the verse says that God will preserve his word forever. The Bishop of London thought, if I burn the Bibles, it'll be gone. They'll be done. My friends, people have tried to burn the word of God since the, since the pages of Scripture. People, people, they've burned the word of God before. What you'll find out, you come to Hebrews, that our God is a consuming fire. And that God's fire of his word is much stronger than man's fire on this earth. So in fact, he did sell. He knew that when, when the bishop burned these Bibles, that people would be enraged by it. So the Bishop of London apparently bought the first run of Tyndale's Bibles. Tyndale paid off all his debts, corrected a couple of printing errors found in the first translation, printed three times as many copies of the Word of God, and passed them out to the, to the multitudes of people who were so enraged by the Bishop of London and his gross blasphemy and burning God's words. My friends, just in a small way, we can remember that God has promised to preserve his word. No matter what man may do. So we look at this psalm and we say, okay, well, what do we do with it? Where do we go with it? There are two questions that I asked at the beginning that I want to pose to us tonight. The first question is this. Which words are you listening to? They're not the same. My friend, every time that we focus on man's words and listen to that, the chirping in our ear, sometimes it's from within. It doesn't have to be external. It can be from within our own heart. Hearts deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Anytime we listen to this, we will be discouraged. We will. David is discouraged here because of man's words that were vanity and deceptive and, and, and trying to lord over him and being prideful. Anytime we listen here, all right, if we listen here, we will be cast down. And yet, it seems like that's the easy solution. Having a bad day, I go here. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I go here. I listen here. I read here. I do this. And if we're not careful, if you're not careful, you will find your mind filled with this kind of communication right here rather than the Word of God. Listen, you got to spend time in God's Word every day, not just so you can check it off a list and say, I spent, but because you need God's valuable, refined, secure, preserved Word in your heart to encourage you. I need to encourage me. God's Word encourages. Man's Word discourages. Listen, I spend time with God in the morning not to say, well, as the pastor, I, I read God's Word. No, no, I need God's wisdom in my life. I don't need to be cast down. I need to be built up. Who are you listening to? Well, pastor, every morning I spend three and a half minutes in God's word. Well, no wonder you're discouraged. No wonder your mind's running 100 miles an hour. No, no wonder, no, no wonder that, that, that things are, are not here. You know why? Because you spent your time here. And there's a contrast. This is not the same as this. So the first question is, who are you listening to? You're not here, get here. Number two, who are you communicating like? Even as Christians, we sometimes, not in the Holy Spirit, in our flesh, communicate this way. We don't speak things that are refined and valuable. We speak things that are, are worthless. And we are called, as God's children, to speak the word of God, his truth. 
God's word is true. It's miraculous in origin, miraculous in durability, miraculous in results, miraculous in harmony, miraculous in the message, miraculous in the preservation. And every time it's in your life, it will produce miraculous results. Who are you listening to? And how are you communicating?